Staying cool, I hope. Everybody's staying cool. Everybody's staying cool. Guys, welcome. When you get on in, say hello. Let us know that you're here. Go ahead and share. We appreciate you to do that. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2 tonight, so just to get in, buckle up. I'm going to go ahead and warn everybody. I hope you brought track shoes because there's a whole lot of ground to cover tonight in a short amount of time. Um, uh, where you're going to think we're at the Olympics, so we're going to be moving on pretty quickly. So Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to pick up at verse 5. Let's open with the, with a word of prayer, and then we are going to dive in. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Lord, for just an opportunity to come together tonight. Father, to study you, study your word. Father, just to, to hear a little bit more about you, to learn a little bit more. And Father, just to grow closer to you. Father, tonight, we just pray for those that are here. Thank you, Father, for the ones that made the effort to be out here tonight. And, Father, for the ones that are, here, are not here, Father, for reasons only known to you. Father, speak to us tonight. Watch over us, protect us, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Last week. Last week, we started out chapter 2, uh, and we asked four rhetorical questions. And it was almost those well-duh questions, because everything came back with a, with a really, really resound yes as, as an answer. And then he said in verses 3 and 4, okay, that because of all of those questions are undoubtedly yes, verse 3, then let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but... In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Okay, beginning in verse 5, okay, Paul is going to give us, he's going, he's going to change his, his, his approach, really. He's going to give us a what before describing the why that's going to come in verses 6 through 11. And all of it is connected back to verses 1 through 4. So let's look at verse 5 for just a minute, okay? Verse 5, Paul says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, he's in a prison cell, writing to a church that he only spent three weeks with. He knows things are going good there. He's trying to pump them up with joy and rejoicing in the Lord. And he gives them this statement. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's talking to the church. Believers are directed to have the mind of Christ. Okay. The verb in here, let this, all right, let this, is from the Greek word phroneo. Phroneo, which means that this statement is actually not let this mind, but more have this mind. In other words, it's, it's a directive. Let this mind or mind this of Christ be in you. It is a forward, aggressive approach. Don't just think about it, just go ahead and do it. But when we read Paul's terminology and how it's, it's broken down here, we read it, let this mind be in you, which means that it's actually giving us a choice. So we as believers have a choice as to whether or not we want the mind of Christ in us or not. Let's go back just a little bit to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 16. Paul writes this to the church at Corinth. He says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So, at the church at Corinth, Paul is, is, is letting us know that we have the mind of Christ. So basically, it's are we going to use it? Are we going to, to put it forth? And that makes sense because we as believers, we've got the mind of Christ, but do we follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and to put it together? And can, can we all just agree that many times we kind of argue with the Holy Spirit going back and forth? <laughs> like, yeah, no, I don't know so much about that. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Is this what I'm supposed to do or not? Okay, so when, when we have a, a, a couple uh, texts like this, uh, and, and we come down back here in, in Philippians, it lets us know that we have a choice as to whether or not we want to use it. The characteristics of this mind of Christ are what we just read in verses 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Now, having said that, does those two verses not reflect Christ? Yes. It's a perfect description 
of Christ. So the essence of the mind of Christ is humility and sacrificial love for others. What does it mean to you to have the mind of Christ? What does it mean to you to have the mind of Christ? And again, we can only have this as believers, by the way. So what does it mean to you? If you're watching, I love your answers as well. What does it mean to you to have the mind of Christ? See you the way he did. Okay. All right. Good. Good. How can we do that? Humility. Humility is the key, isn't it? Yeah, humility is absolutely the key. Have the mind of Christ. Are we successful at this? I think the phrase is, is at times. <laughs> yeah, I think we can say at times. And I think we can all agree that we strive for this, but there's just that, oh man, we just can't, that, that flesh comes in, don't it? I mean, that flesh comes in. Verses 6 through 11, and we're, we're going to spend quite a bit of time here. Uh, verses 6 through 11 are five of the most powerful passages in the entire New Testament. Now, look, we're going to read them in its entirety, and then we're going to come back and we're going to break apart. Okay, verse 6. Actually, I'm going to read 5 and roll right into it. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, again talking about Jesus, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. We've heard this, uh, you know, hundreds of times, right? Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, these five verses are known in the Greek as the kenosis passage. It's Greek word K-E-N-O-S-I-S. Kenosis passage. Kenosis. Any idea of what the word kenosis means? Any, anybody want to take a guess? Kenosis. Okay. No, no, and that's a good guess. No, no, no. I want you to just think about it. And I'm going to tell us here in just a minute. Kenosis. Okay. This text, okay, is, is what is, is called one of the four great Christological passages in all of the New Testament. Here are the other three. So I'm going to go ahead and give these to you. One, it's, it's this, Philippians 2, 6 through 11. The other three are this. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. That's John 1, 1 through 18. The second is found in Colossians, and there's two sections of Colossians. It's Colossians 1, verses 15 through 23. That's Colossians 1, 15 through 23. And Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. So Colossians 1, 15 through 23, and Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. And the fourth one is Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. Christological passages. Now, these five verses here in Philippians, where we are, are thought to be a hymn. Now, you just think about this. It was thought to be a song that Paul wrote, that Paul had for everybody. And it's divided in half. The, 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 the verses 6 through 8 is going to talk about Christ's humiliation, and verses 9 through 11 is Christ's exaltation. So we've got a, a two stanza here, song, if you just want to know the truth. In this text, this Christological passage here, Paul is giving us a very strong affirmation of the deity of Christ. The word kenosis means to empty. In other words, to empty. If you were to go war, war, boy, that was good. That's like wash, W-O-R-S-H, when y'all wash clothes. Okay. Mm -hmm. if, if you were to go out here and take uh, a bucket of water and you were to pour it out, you were to empty it. Okay. You are emptying it of the water. And that is the kenosis of the container. Okay. 
the kenosis of the container. You probably have a live well in your boat, okay? And which means you probably have to empty the live well, okay? When you get back home or when you leave the lake. At that point, it, the, the boat is undergoing a kenosis. You are emptying the live well to, to get it back to a, an empty vessel. And so kenosis here to empty is used because it speaks of the self-emptying, if you will, of, of Jesus as the Son of God as he became incarnate. Now, guys, this is a deep passage, and, and I don't want us to, to get into muddy water. I want us to keep it, keep it clear here. Jesus' character is the very essence of his deity. When he came to earth, he did not give up his deity. All right? Now, we have some people that will say, mm, Jesus is just another holy man. Okay? And I'm sure we've all heard that. Okay? That is incorrect. With Jesus in the flesh, he sets aside, he, he steps away from that divine glory, but he doesn't set aside his divine nature. He was fully man, and yet he was still fully God. With Jesus in the flesh, he took upon himself the true attributes of man because there was nothing about him as a man that you and I as humans didn't feel. He hurt, okay? Uh, he bled, he cried, he laughed, okay? He had the, the, the true attributes of a human being because he was fully flesh. Christ, Christ though, pre-existed his arrival on, on earth in the form of God. And when he came to earth, he took on the, 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 the likeness, if you will, of man. His humanity is real, yet his being is still that of, of deity. So the incarnation, when he came to earth, and we'll see this here in just a minute but over in John, the incarnation was not a subtraction of deity, but instead it was an addition of humanity. Does that make sense? Okay. And I know we've all said this. He, he's, he's fully God. He's fully man. You know, he is the God man. But do we really break this down? And I, I do want us to understand that. It's not a subtraction of deity. At no time did he ever not be God while he was on this earth. He set aside the outward expression of his deity while in expressing himself as a bond servant. And we're going to talk about the, the bond servant idea here in just a little bit. Here, here in this, this passage in 6 through 11, is the humility of Christ. He humbled himself to become obedient even unto the death of himself on the cross. This passage, 6 through 11 here, emphasizes the preeminence of, of that, 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 that atonement that was coming and the salvation of God. Now let's ask ourselves this question. How are we doing with the concept of kenosis, of emptying ourselves for others? And that's a hard question. How are we doing to empty ourselves for others? How easy is it for us to put others first? Now, I'm going to go ahead and speak real quick. It's easy to put our kids in front of us, isn't it? Okay. It's real easy to put our grandkids in front of it. Okay. And many times, grandparents, we're probably going to put the little guy in front of the, the mom or the dad. Okay. We're just going to do it. Okay. It's just the way it works out. But how about others? I can't say your neighbor because, Johnny, your neighbor's with Gloria, so I'm not going to say that, so I'll, I'm going to talk about you know, someone else. How, how about somebody that's just out here that you've never met? How are we doing emptying ourselves for others, the, the kenosis, okay? It's not easy, is it? It's not easy, is it, at all? Yet that is the example that Christ gave us. He emptied himself in order to put on that, that, that flesh so that he could do what he did on this earth. Let's look at verse 6. Who being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Jesus was in the form of God. What this does is, is this is his pre-incarnate existence. Okay, let's remember, prior. we all know the Christmas story. Prior to the Christmas story, okay, Jesus' existence began long before Bethlehem, didn't it? 
And do we sometimes forget that? That, okay, well, all of a sudden Jesus is here. He's in Bethlehem. He's the little baby. That's it. No, 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 no. We have to remember Jesus' existence began well beyond Bethlehem. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. And this may be redundant for some of you, and, and that's okay. Sometimes we just need a refresher. John, John, we'll get there in a minute. Genesis 1. Genesis 1, look at verses 1 and 2. Super simple. Super simple. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the what? And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, you've already got an identity that was taking place of Jesus and the Holy or of God and the Holy Spirit. We know that's there, okay? Then you, you fast forward 23 verses, and, and that's when God is speaking the world into existence, and we roll into verse 26, and Scripture says this, Then God said, Let us, capital U, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness okay so now you've got the plurality that's coming in and you've got you've got god you know you've got the holy spirit that's there okay and now then you've got god himself saying let us so god is identifying that that the the, the, the triune godhead is there but we don't see the third party of the godhead trinity there do we it's not visible we don't see it until we get to john chapter one so uh, flick on over there to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 in verse 1. And let's look at this. In John chapter 1, verse 1, John starts out this. In the beginning, okay, so does that sound familiar? If we go back to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, okay, we're right back here. In the beginning was the Word, the capital W. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word here, uh, do, we, do we know the, the translation for the word, word here? It's Logos, that's right, it is Logos. It is Jesus is who we're talking about here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light that shines, or the, excuse me, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So now you've got the, the Trinity, the, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all the way back at the beginning of time, as far as the Bible knows. So, there has never been a time when Jesus didn't exist. But yet, we scroll right on down in John 1, look at verse 14. And the Word, again, capital W, the Logos, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So there's never been a point in time when Jesus didn't exist. We just got to be blessed with his presence when he came to this earth and spent roughly 33 years. Okay, now evidently, when we back up and we look at this letter in Philippians, do you get the idea that even though they're on the right track, that there's, there's some kind of a unity and a, and, and a humility issue in the church? Do you think that? Because Paul's lighting it out here real quick, and he's hitting it pretty doggone hard. In verses 6 through 11 here, he really comes uncorked with, with this thing. I mean, Paul is laying out the humility of Christ in full display. He says this, the mind of Christ, the humble mind of Christ. This is the mind that you need to have. Verse 6, if we were to you know, kind of expand on it. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery, which that means something to be held on, uh, to be equal, to be equal with God. When Jesus came to earth, he didn't hang on to the privileges of the deity. Now, think about this, okay? Jesus could have called thousands of angels to get him off the cross. He did not have to do that. 
Jesus did not have to go through that arrest in the garden. He did not have to go through that trial that he went back and forth like a ping pong ball. He did not have to be beaten and humiliated to where he was completely disfigured by, by man before he was ever put on the cross. He did not have to do that, okay? That's humility. And when you really think about it, do you think that there were times during his some 33 years on this earth that he that he just could have said, you know, I'm just done. How many times would we have thrown in the flag? And said, I'm just done. I mean, most of us are twice that age. Denise is here, so she's almost triple that age. No, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, she's at the back table, and she's not a, not a good aim, so I'm okay till I get home. Okay. <laughs> But you just think about that. How many times just over life have you just got fed up with just stuff and said, I'm done. I'm just done. Jesus never once did it. He could have stopped all of those beatings. He could have stopped the humiliation. But he didn't. He took the role of the suffering servant, the perfect example of, of humility. Verse 7, but he made himself of no reputation. No reputation. Didn't want that name for himself. Taking the form of a bond servant. Okay? Not just a man, but he took the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. We come right back to this word, uh, kenosis. He made himself of no reputation. Jesus' incarnation was a self-emptying, if you will, except that he never emptied himself of his deity. He was fully man, but he was always fully God, even on the cross. Have you thought about that? He was fully God when they were driving the nails in his hands. Now that's mind-boggling to me. Fully God. When he came to earth, he came in the likeness of men, but not just a man. He took the form of a slave. That's what a bondservant is. And again, a direct example of humility. In verse 8, in being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. In verse 8, we find the extent of Jesus' self-emptying. Hebrews 5.8 says this, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. See, when God sits on his throne in all of his glory, there's no one that he obeys. You think about that. Now, when he's on his throne, you're not telling God what to do, right? It's just not happening. We want to, but we saw how that worked with Lucifer, right? I mean, that didn't work real well. So that's all gone. Jesus could only do this by this kenosis, by emptying himself, by coming down from the throne and becoming a man. Jesus learned through experience as a fleshly man and through all of the temptation and all of a sudden, remember, he, he, he was tempted just like we are, okay? And he suffered what it meant to suffer, and yet he triumphed in a way that he did not experience before his incarnation. He never knew what that was like prior to coming to earth in all of the years of existence. What are some of the ways that you think Jesus humbled himself over his time on earth? What are some of the ways? He washed feet. That's right. He did wash feet. Exactly. What else? What are some of the ways that Jesus humbled himself? What are some ways you think that Jesus humbled himself? The most humiliating death. Absolutely, it was. And not only the most humiliating form of death, but they did it in the most humiliating way. Yeah, so it was all compounded. I in the wilderness, 40 days. That's right, that's right. And then to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan right after that. I mean, you know, right on heels of that. 
I went through half a dozen commentaries as I was studying and preparing this. And, and I was beginning to see a pattern as to how some of the uh, some of the writers were, were listing some of the ways that Jesus humbled himself. And so I wrote these down. And these are not mine. This is all out of commentaries. But it just, when I read this and I really processed this, it just it's kind of magnified his humility. He was humble in that he took the form of a man and not a glorious creature like an angel. Okay, what do you think about that? He didn't have to just walk in. He could just move, uh, that's right. He could have just, you know, shabam. Yeah, sure could have. Uh, he was humble in that he was born into an obscure, oppressed place. Okay. He was humble in that he was born into poverty among a despised people. Okay. Uh, he was humble in that he was born as a child instead of coming in first as a man. Okay. He was humble in that he was born into a common family instead of the home of a king. He was humble in submitting to the obedience appropriate to a child in a household. He had to listen to mom and dad. He was humble in learning and practicing a trade, a humble trade of a builder. He was humble in the long wait until he launched out into his public ministry. So, I mean, you, you, you think about that. He lived... As a as a classic human being, you know, for roughly twenty nine years, twenty nine thirty years, just doing his thing, working alongside his dad, and we have zero documentation as to what went on. He was humble in the companions and the disciples he chose. Now he picked ragtag thugs out here, you know, that's good to to be his disciples. He was humble in the audience that he appealed to and the way he taught. He was humble in the temptations that he allowed and he endured. He was humble in the weakness and the hunger and the thirst and the tiredness that he endured. He was humble in his total obedience to his heavenly father through all of that. And he didn't have to because he was God, but he did. He was humble in his submission to the Holy Spirit. He was humble in choosing and submitting to that humiliating death on the cross. He was humble in the agony of death. He was humble in the shame and the mocking and the public humiliation prior to his death. And he was humble in enduring the spiritual agony of his sacrifice on the cross. Even in the flesh, he called out to God, My God, my God, why is thou for forsaken me? Complete humility. The ultimate extent of Jesus' humility and obedience was his death on the cross. I want us to think about it like this. Even the death on the cross proves to us that there is absolutely no limit whatsoever to what God will do to show us his love and give his saving power to us. And he didn't even make himself like a good-looking, macho kind of man that said yeah. it in the Bible that he was unattractive. That's right. Not at all. He didn't make himself, you know, about worldly looks or anything like that. And, and there's actual scriptures, and, and yeah. we all know this. I can't quote them off the top of my head, to where it referenced, you know, like a good-looking yeah. man or, or something like that. And we know David was the little ruddy, you know, runt that was out there. So so there's documentation when it was uh, when it was needed, but there was nothing here. So he was just your common everyday guy. Charles Spurgeon said this about his humility. He said, the lower he stoops to save us, the higher we ought to lift him in our adoring reverence. Blessed be his name, he stoops and stoops and stoops. And when he reaches our level and becomes man, he still stoops and stoops and stoops lower and deeper yet. Now that's, that's, that's a good, good check right there. Verse 9, therefore, Love that first word. Therefore speaks volumes here. In other words, because Jesus did indeed empty himself to the fullest extent. Because of that, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Now we get to see the ultimate example of exaltation after humility. Okay, let's, let's piece this thing apart though. Who's doing the exalting? It wasn't Jesus, was it? He didn't exalt himself. God did it. Jesus didn't say, Whew, now that that's over, I'm going to do this. 
all right? Watch me work. He didn't do this. This was all his father's. And did you notice? Okay, let's read this again. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name. We'll come back to this. What stands out about that statement? Which one? I'm sorry. Okay, it's verse, uh, verse 9. Yeah, the first part of verse 9. It, that's right. Notice he didn't say that God has exalted him. He said God has also highly exalted him. Big difference here. Okay, and again, I go back to Spurgeon. I love Spurgeon. Spurgeon writes this. Now just pause over this thought that God did not, or excuse me, that Christ did not crown himself, but that his father crowned him. That he did not elevate himself to the throne of majesty, but that his father lifted him there and placed him on his throne. It was all his father's doing. And what did he do? Give him the name which is above every name. What does that mean to you? That Jesus, that name is the name above every name. What does it mean? Exactly. Exactly. I don't think we grasp the magnitude of that statement. That that name is it. Uh, one of my favorite passages, Luke 10, 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. In your name. Uh, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every knee. Those in heaven, on earth. Okay. Let's, let's think about this. Not only is Jesus exalted by the Father, okay, but the entire universe is now brought into submission to Jesus. Every person, past, present, future, will confess Jesus Christ as Lord, whether we are willingly doing it by faith or whether we are not. It's going to happen. Every knee is going to bow before Jesus Christ. One way or the other. And then as we read those those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. What we're talking about here is a complete totality of all creation recognizing the superiority of Christ. You guys, just think about it. There is coming a time when not only are believers going to be caught breath breathless, but can you imagine the pure awestruck that people without Jesus are going to have at that moment? You, you just think about that. There's coming a time when the people that have refused Jesus for their lifetime now have to acknowledge that they were wrong. It's going to be more than just an uh-oh. That's right. Yeah. It's going to be a whole lot more than just an uh-oh. It's, uh, it's like, well, can I go back and, and change? And at that point, it's too late. You, you just you, you just can't can't go back there. And, and this combination, every knee shall bow, every tongue should confess. This combination gives us the evidence, and it, and it gives us the picture, if you will, of complete submission to Jesus, and it's required of everybody, whether we do it faithfully or whether we not. And what are we confessing? It's real simple. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, why? Why? Let's think about this, and we're about to wrap it up. Why was this passage of Scripture so important for Paul to get across to the Philippian church. Because, yes, it's important to us. We know that. But he wrote this to the Philippian church. So why, why was it so detrimental, if you will, for Paul to get it to them, uh, to make sure they got it, even though he couldn't go himself, he makes sure they get this message. Why? I, I truly think they were in the middle of it. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, let's just kick this around. What, what would make it? But now we know they got a great reputation because Paul's already acknowledged that. So what? What would be Paul's motivation to write this statement? And, and let me read it back in its entirety. Okay. 
And he, he says to the church, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Did y'all catch that? It's more than just obedient to the point of death. Okay? More than that. It was to the death on the cross, which is a step, really it's a step beyond just regular death because that was a execution. There, it was, exactly. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why is this message that important to that church? And we know it is important, right? I mean, we have to, we have to acknowledge that. It is important. I've got four things. Number one, to equip them to keep pushing through the hardships that they were or would be experienced, kind of like what you just said, okay? Secondly, to help them truly understand Jesus' hardships and that they're not going to go through anything compared to what he did, okay? To help them understand the need for real unity in the middle of their hard times. And, and finally, and I've got this as a church, to help them understand that real unity begins with real humility. So that is all I have got. Thoughts, questions, comments. If you're watching online, any thoughts, questions, or comments that you might have, we'd love to hear from you. And we'll give you guys just a few minutes to get those out here online, and then we will say goodnight to you. Yeah, to equip them to keep pushing through the hardships. I mean, when you look at what Jesus himself went through and did for us, then it makes everything that we're going through, even today, look like a cakewalk. To help them truly understand Christ's hardships, to help them to understand the need for real unity in the middle of their hard times. Unity in the church will go through hard times just like a hot knife through butter. To help them to understand that real unity begins with real humility. So, good stuff you here. You can't be obedient to God without humility. You can't experience true joy in Christ without humbling yourself. Exactly right. And us as well as them. I know what American uh, secular culture today is. We we tend to think we to be exalted. We need to throw our efforts in. You know, we've got to exalt ourselves. But, uh, and I've read somewhere, somebody used Mother Teresa as an example to serve the outcasts of society. Yeah. But by doing that, she garnered the right to stand before kings and princes and presidents. That's right. Just as bold as anybody could. With, without hesitation. Without hesitation. That's a great example. That's a great example. Any other thoughts? Come in. All right. Well, online folks, we thank you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we're going to say good night to you at this point and hope you can join me tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. as we are continuing. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Good stuff. See you guys in the morning. Good night.